Yo, everybody. Welcome to Hot Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the writer of comics like Newburn, Captara, Universal Truce, Batman, and Avengers Twilight, as well as the cartoonists of Public Domain. It's Chip Zdarsky. Thanks for coming on, Chip. Woo! Thanks for having me back. Woo! <laughs> is it a woo morning? How's the day starting for you? Uh, um, it's like, it's like, make it till, uh, fake it till you make it. It's like, woo it until you feel it. I don't know. It's like, woo. You don't naturally get <laughs> woo energy to talk to me. What the heck is going on here? I feel betrayed already. By the end, by the end, I'll have woo energy. That's the thing. I'm, I'm counting on you to fill me with your woo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just, just fill me up. I'm Please. uncomfortable with filling you with my woo. I don't, I don't know fill about me this. My, fill me with your woo. <laughs> You're in Toronto. It's noonish there. We're recording in Alaska around eight. We have wildly different schedules. But one of the things I think about when I do these interviews is I did that list of comics you're working on. You have like five different books, one of which you're drawing and writing. You have a lot of things on your schedule. Yeah. How do you like balance everything? Like, do you have a set schedule for how you work or is it fairly dictated by deadlines and like which fire needs to be put out next? It's definitely a fire put out kind of deal. Um yeah, I don't know. I mean, we were just talking before hitting record that like you kind of have to treat this as a job, and and that's where a lot of people kind of fall down, where they kind of f- fuck off and do other things, and kind of like you know wait for the muse to strike or do warm up warm up sketches and quotes, which is just like a dopamine hit on Instagram, really, because they're not doing it for themselves. But I just I've gotten kind of natural anxiety that forces me to wake up at like five, five thirty in the morning, along with the cats scratching my face. <laughs> and I'm usually, I'm usually working at six, six thirty, And I, I do that until about five when I go back indoors to make dinner. I turn off the internet basically for the day and just kind of get to it. It's funny. I was talking to a friend the other day who she's an artist and she's always like wildly distracted. And uh, at some point, I was having dinner with her, and I was just like, "Well, yeah, you've got classic ADHD. Like, obviously, like <laughs> you just can't actually get to the thing you need to get to." And it kind of broke her mind. She never thought about it that way. And then she got a medication. She was just like, "Oh yeah, now like I get up and I sit down, I do work, and and like I feel like I had ADHD when I was a kid um, because my parents would hide my comics from me and video games and stuff, and like lock them away because I just couldn't do anything, any schoolwork. Like I would just start and then i'd wander over to my comic collection and reread amazing spider-man 289 for the one millionth time and even through college i found it hard but like the the, the projects that i did well on were group projects because i have a strong desire to not let people down yeah and and i think that's what's kind of turned it around for me it kind of broke me out of that cycle uh working on sex criminals with matt like i didn't want to let him down so i just i just plugged away at it and doing stuff for marvel or dc like i had that feeling with the artists i just can't let them down to left to my own devices like public domain is the hardest book because yeah. the only person i'm letting down is me which is why it usually ends up going to the bottom of the, the work list it's not healthy necessarily but it does get stuff done like i'm no i'm no jeff lemire like <laughs> if you ever read like jeff's like blog post about his work schedule it's like yes it's nuts like he just you can write three scripts on a flight like he's boom 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 i remember talking to jeff on the podcast about it and it was kind of i don't this is going to sound like i'm complimenting myself too much but i was like this is the closest i've talked to a comic creator where it sounded like me because he kind of seems like he's kind of always writing on background like even when he's when he's away he's just kind of always working always working and then he gets onto a script and so at that point he's kind of almost like a stenographer for his own thoughts as opposed to a lot of people it's like you want that separation and it seems like for jeff he doesn't have it i guess with public domain like at least you have like you know you don't want to let allison down yeah yeah i've got i've got my editor allison and um and there's still there's people who pay for it, uh, an image who wants it, so um, that keeps me going. Like, you know, I'm in the second arc right now, and I've completed issues six, seven, and eight, and uh, I just shot reference for nine and ten. And I don't think I would have been able to do that if it wasn't for the fact that I'm still posting them on Substack. Yeah, like that that helps a lot. Like, I I don't want to go more than a couple of weeks without posting another chapter, because um, then you just start to feel super guilty because people are paying for it. I remember Ed Brubaker telling me one time that his kind of the thing that keeps him going all the time is the fact that like Sean Phillips is always like, 
feed me pages, feed me yeah. pages, feed me yeah. pages. And it is interesting where it's, I think a lot of times people think about deadlines as the defining driver of how do I keep going? How do I keep doing this? But I think I think the idea of not wanting to let your collaborators down is a lot more, I don't know, pressing, a lot more important than people really think about in the equation. Because, you know, when you think about your, like, let's talk Avengers uh, Twilight, when you're talking about that, it's not just you have to get pages to Daniel, but then it also has to go to the letterer. And it starts having this compounding effect down the line if you don't get the script, not to, yeah. like, fuel your anxiety or anything like no, that. No, no, it's 100% true. And, like, I... I... I I felt it when I was doing Sex Criminals as the artist, because there were definitely issues where Matt was late on script, and um, and he's going through stuff too. So you know, there's empathy there, but also like, oh, like I turned down projects anticipating those scripts, or like you know, not having those scripts means I'm not working. If I'm not working, I'm not making money. It's not like you're on a salary job where it's like you still make the same amount every day, whether or not that day produces work or not. Um, and I think about that a lot, like. I get maybe maybe a bit too angry at writers who fuck up on their script deliveries. Like, you know, it's like part of the process. Or the, the muse didn't strike them or whatever, or they were busy. I'm like, man, you have fucked over everyone after you. Like, <laughs> like the artist and the letter and the colorist, and the editor, uh, all the way down to the shops in some cases. And it's like, you, you really have to have that in mind. Like when you're, when you're saying down to write, like it's not going to be perfect, whatever you're writing, but yeah, it's got to get done. It's got to get done. I know there's some some writers that can do it in in bursts, like pages, like just give an artist a couple of pages, and I can't quite do that. So I, I've I've got to I've got to stay as ahead as I possibly can. Do you send out full scripts? Yeah, always. Oh wow. Yeah, there's only one time where I sent out a uh, um, a half a script, and that was on Marvel Two and One because Jim Chung was the artist and he did issue one and issue two. And then it became very evident that um, he wasn't going to be able to do issue three, four or five. So all of a sudden they were like, we, he's going to need the script for issue six. I'm just like, well, I don't even, I don't even have that in my head. Like I don't. So I had to like kind of start writing fast on three, four, at least to kind of feel good about do jumping onto issue six. And so I got him like half of issue six at like Christmas break or something. I thought you were going to say you just wrote like a one page splash that said the thing. What a revolt in <laughs> development. And then you'll just yeah. figure it out from there. Well, if I really wanted to trick him, it should be the thing with a bunch of floating trucks and cars and, <laughs> and crowds at the end of, of the horses. multiverse. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that felt terrible. Like I don't particularly like writing a um, jumping around with scripts either. On Daredevil, I had to do it a couple of times. And, uh, and that's, I'm not a fan of that. Like even right now on Batman, I'm like, I'm super ahead because I can see you know, we've got a couple of fill-in things coming up, and I'm like, well, I I, I want to write all the way up to those chronologically instead of jumping ahead and and having to do like issue 151 or whatever for another artist without having done issue 148. Like I just I need to get all those scripts done because things change. Do you have to work further ahead on that than you did on your Marvel work because it's a big headliner flagship type book? Um, yes, but I mean, mostly it's because of like kind of shipping requirements. And and, uh, and with Jorge, Jorge really wants to dry everything and that's impossible. So I've got to really make sure that like that the schedule works out where he gets a, a good proper burst of issues to, to do. And it's funny, like we tried to buy time because I had this idea for um, this uh, Joker um, year one storyline. And I remember saying to my editor and to Jorge, I'm just like, this will buy you some time because this is all set both in the past and the future. So it's not the current story, um, but it ties into the current story. So I wanted to give Jorge the, the assurance that, you know, our story is still our story. Don't worry. This is like a, a side thing. And I'm like, we can do three issues buy you all this time uh it'd be great and then our editor got nervous that we were doing three issues that weren't about batman <laughs> so i don't like batman's in it a fair amount but like but his nervousness meant that he wanted them all to come out in one month so all of a sudden we have three 30 page issues coming out in february to, to do the joker story 
So we've only bought one month. I have to write 90 pages to buy one month of, of time for Jorge. I'm like, oh, God damn it. I'm getting him a long break. I'm getting him a one month break. That is yeah. not the same yeah. thing. No, it's very much not the same thing. Well, Jorge is like a machine, though. Like that guy's a page a day guy and without fail. Like, and they're gorgeous every time. So I don't understand how he's human. He's basically the closest we have to Batman, basically, in the fact that he draws <laughs> yeah. the best and also it looks like an Instagram model. I remember when I yeah. first went on to his Instagram, I was just like, am I on the wrong Jorge's page? What is, what is going on? Yeah. This, is, this man is too attractive. This is uh, meeting him in Barcelona was, um, was a horrible <laughs> because, uh, all of a sudden I was signing next to a guy who looks like that. And I remember <laughs> thinking I sat down because we both had our separate lines next to each other. And, uh, I remember looking over at his line. It was all like, beautiful young women who just wanted to meet him uh and my line was guys in batman shirts <laughs> and i was like oh okay that's where i'm at now i'm right right, <laughs> right next to jorge jimenez and uh and he is he is the bell of the ball like new york comic-con was really funny because he'd he'd done a bunch of commissions before the show and it's so rare I, 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 he hadn't been to new york in i don't i think ever and um so like the first few people in line, it was a massive line for us. Um, but when I say that, I mean, it's mostly for Jorge because like the first group were all these young women who flew in from like Hong Kong to pick up the fucking six grand worth of commissions they got from them. And then to drop another like four grand or whatever on prints and like more doodles and just to like bask in his glow and to get like photos taken with him and to touch his arms. Like it was and I was like kind of standing there, like I'd signed the books already. They moved on to Jorge. And I was just looking at this line that was clearly like three hours long. And I just had the expression like, I don't know what to do here. I'm so sorry. Like they weren't <laughs> moving. It was like 20 minutes with this one group. And, I'm like, and the whole week, it was kind of like that. Like nobody wanted to continue past Jorge. They wanted to stay and, and again, bask in his light, which was amazing. But also just like my stress levels watching that line up stay the same like was like oh god <laughs> i love the thought of that in combination with the i don't even know if this is real you posted a picture of the the photo cover of sex criminals number one but it's a mm -hmm. 10th anniversary edition with you and matt and it's like yeah. with the natural passage of aging <laughs> yeah and it's like comparing that with I, I say this with respect it sounds like i'm just like hmm. man you and ugo chip but at the same time oh, no 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 it's it's very true yeah and it's, it's that weird thing where like and my wife pointed this out to me. She's like, you've always acted like you're too old. Like, <laughs> like when you're 30, you're just like, oh, I'm over the hill. When you're 40, I'm over the hill. Like, and whenever you look back at the photos from 10 years ago, you're like, oh, actually, I was young and like uh, kind of attractive. But you never feel like it during the time. You just feel whatever small amount of gray hair you have. But yeah, seeing those, seeing those covers side by side, I'm just like, oof, it was rough. I went out and got this haircut like the next day. Because I'm like, I need to do something to <laughs> retain my looks. You looked at the, your own cover and you were like, I need to change something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we played it up for laughs, obviously, but there's a lot of reality in the uh, in that horrible passage of time. Is that cover real? I mean, because it is the 10th anniversary of Sex Criminals. You have the complete edition coming out on a March 27th, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean it's the tenth anniversary of the the first issue. Is that yeah. something you're really doing, or is that just a gag? I mean, we weren't, but now we're thinking of doing it. Like, I just made that for because at the end of the collection, we have just kind of a back and forth interview between Matt and myself about the book to fill up the four pages. And I opened it with the old photo cover, and I closed it with the the quote unquote new photo cover. And that's just a gag for the book, but also looking at it, I'm just like, maybe we do a reissue. I've always wanted to do like, I've always had, we always have dumb money losing ideas. I wanted to do an issue where we did it, like got 3D conversion on it. <laughs> so you have to have glasses to see all the, all the things popping out at you. I, I've always wanted to do a family friendly version where I go through and I get rid of anything sexy in it and <laughs> change all the language. Like finally, sex criminals, you can give your kid. Would you just like erase panels, or would you? <laughs> that would be well. A that's much a thing. Like it, it would be a, it would be a, a stupid amount of work because I'd redraw panels, like I'd change it so like you know they're gently kissing instead of having sex or whatever. Right. <laughs> kissing criminals, I guess we'd call it. There we go. Yeah, I still I still might do it. 
It sounds like uh, Ryan Brown would always do remixes of his God Hates Astronaut one shots where it was like, yeah. I forgot, he would always rename them in other like GHA structures. It would be different words for that. And then all he would do is re-letter the issue and make it somehow more insane. And yeah. I always really appreciated that because it really does become a completely different comic. But I did like the uh, the the line at the top of the 10th anniversary edition, which was from the writer of senior seniors living magazine and the <laughs> artist of his grandkids birthday cards. It was very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. The, the remixing I, I years ago, before I was working at Marvel, I started my own personal project where I was re lettering all of the original secret wars. Nice. Just making it as stupid as possible. Yeah. It's a, it's like, it's that tiger lily movie that Woody Allen one where he just like redubbed really? everything from like, I didn't yeah, know what was it? he redubbed like a James Bond movie or something like that. I forget exactly what it was, but but yeah, that kind of remixing. I, if I had more time, I'd, I'd probably do it. Uh, I mean, Will Moss is listening and he's like, this sounds like a pretty interesting idea to do with Secret Wars. I like that. <laughs> it's pretty fun. You are revisiting this book after 10 years. Has it been interesting revisiting it in the process of putting that book together? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um yeah, just going through the pages, I'm like, like that first issue is still a good issue. I don't much like the art in it. <laughs> I think it's quite natural for most artists uh, after time. Like, I'm really trying really hard on that issue. You can tell, like, like every brick is drawn, every book is drawn in the background. Um, but there's so many things that are off that I'm just like, oh, yeah, it doesn't quite work. But then I kind of flip to the last issue. And I'm like, oh, man, this actually works. Like, and you can see the progression, which is really nice. And it's it's the thing that I'm going to be mostly known for uh, until I die, like, like, like weird, weirdly enough, like even working on Batman now, I'm just like, let's well, it's still not as big as when I did Sex Criminals. Like, nothing I do is ever going to kind of hit that mark again. Um, That's an interesting point you just made because I think some people would hear that and think that you're crazy. Because it's Batman. Like, what's bigger than Batman? But there's a difference between... the Batman fans read for Batman. Batman fans don't yeah. read for you. And I say yeah. that with respect. No, and, no, it's true. It's 100% true. And so when the people were following sex criminals, they were following it for you, and they were following it for Matt, and they were following it to see where you, you two would take them on this... Yeah. Susie and John on this journey regardless of like, I mean, like you were the people guiding them. And so you were inseparable yeah. from it in a way that you just never would be in Batman. And I think that's a really yeah. real thing. Yeah. And it's funny when, when we first started doing sex criminals and started doing sh the shows, like it was, you know, it's weird to say a thing you worked on was a phenomenon, but it was like, we, we were just anything we made just sold out right away. And, um, and that show was like, the lines were nuts. But the funny thing is like, all I had was sex criminals. So I, I was just signing sex criminals, uh, whereas Matt had all of his Marvel stuff. So there were still Marvel fans there to see him for like Thor and Iron Man. But when you looked at our line, you could immediately tell who was who. Like for the most part, the sex criminals fans in line were either couples or young women. They were happy. They were eager to like get their book signed to meet us. And then there'd be like kind of miserable dudes in line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all out right now, Chip. What not 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 all, but like guys who are there because like I gotta get all these signed. I have to get all these signed. Like there's a compulsion, sure, or whatever. And yeah, and sure enough, you know, I mean, Matt's policy is my policy. If I did it, I'll sign it. So they'd bring like stacks of like a hundred issues, and he just do, 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 go through them all. And some were you know really grateful, and some were just like kind of just there to get them signed. Um, and I remember looking at that thinking like. Man, if I do this long enough, maybe that'll be my lineup, and it is. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I still, I still have the mix. Like, you have like the people who are buying the independent stuff and sex criminals fans, and then you know Batman Daredevil fans, and like for the most part, they're all like super sweet and nice. Um, even the ones who don't know who you are, they just want you to sign a Batman utility belt. Like, did you sign a Batman utility belt? I've signed so many Batman things. Yeah, and Daredevil things like. And uh, that's fun, like to see your name with all the other kind of people that have worked on the character, like these uh, these weird little autograph projects. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and people are really sweet about Batman and Daredevil, but always in the back of your head, you're like, yeah, well, because it's Daredevil and Batman. Yeah, like like you can't you can't really separate that. Like there are people who are just like who came to like the Daredevil comic because of the show. Uh, I meet a lot of people like that, 
and then they they're really excited about the comics like this is great it feels like a continuation of the show and like i'm like oh awesome i'm glad it works for you and also in your head you're like yeah you needed all the other steps (laughs) of that character in that book in that series it kind of reminds me of you talking about sex criminals it reminds me of at emerald city comic-con one year where i went to go i think i was actually going to pick up my hardcover for the wicked and divine i don't know why i was picking it up there or something like that or maybe i was yeah. just getting it signed by kieran and jamie and they had the whole team there and matt and yeah and Clayton i remember that year and it was really funny because i go up and i was like dang i can't believe they don't have a line i go up right to the front and they're like <laughs> uh and i turn yeah. and there's this like massive zigzag <laughs> yeah. line where like everyone is kind of like organized in a way that makes sense And it was a way to, like, make sure that the pathing doesn't get messed up in a way that conventions don't really do so well anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely, with Sex Criminals, we had a lot of that as well, where, like, the first couple shows we did, like, the lines would just, like, cut right across all the other creators. And they'd just be very angry for good reason. But, yeah, we we, uh, at Emerald City, we we had that same setup where, like, people would come to the table like, oh, actually, if you look way down there, that's the lineup. Like, they're just farther away so people can move. I thought it was really interesting because, and I'm not saying that, like, you or, like, Kieran and Jamie or anybody will never have a a moment as big as that, but I think the combination of where Image was at that time and also how those books spoke to communities, Mm -hmm. that passion is really hard to recreate. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely was a moment in time. And there were a bunch of us that like kind of hit at the same in that same period, like uh, Kelly Sue and, and Val was like Bitch Planet as well was kind mm-hmm. of part of that. Obviously, Saga, which was bigger than everything. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a special moment. Um, and yeah, I look back on it fondly uh, and semi exhausted. Like I wouldn't be able to go through that now. That is one of the interesting things about Sex Criminals, though, is is it's not really just ten years of Sex Criminals. It's like ten years of comics for you. And like, yeah. I'm not trying to like look too deeply into your eyes on that 10th anniversary cover and and see the the years <laughs> that have hit. But I mean, when you, have you found yourself thinking about your journey and where you find yourself these days as a result of that anniversary approaching? Because it's, I mean, that's a oh, massive yeah. change in your life. Yeah, no, it was like a whole new career when I was like about to turn 40. Yeah, it's wild. It's been a wild 10 years. And like my wife and I often like kind of stop and think about it like because it's changed her life as well like you know we we both we met at the newspaper and like we were kind of both in this dying industry and uh we both have kind of moved on from there and like have grown as people and like and yeah i've been able to travel the world because of the success of the comics and and even that transition from like artist to writer like maybe that wouldn't have worked like the fact that that worked as well is kind of staggering to me um yeah, I'm extremely lucky, I'm extremely blessed. Like, like I can't, I can't stress it enough. There are days when I get frustrated at the job for sure, and then I just have to stop and go, "Oh my god!" Like, think about what you're doing and where you've come from, and you know, uh, you're writing Batman. It's fine. You're fine. You're fine. It is interesting too, because not to go even further down the depths, but one thing I noticed was I actually, I mean, I kind of figured it out once the. Newburn number 14 hit the week before we're talking. And mm-hmm. Newburn number 14 is the kind of origin story of Eastern Newburn, the, the main character of the book. And yeah. when I read that, I was like, uh oh, this comic's ending. And then I looked and I was like, this comic's ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in- yeah. <laughs> it's ending with Newburn number 16 in May. And then I figured Avengers Twilight is probably wrapping either in April or May because it's a six issue yeah. miniseries. Although, like, yep. two issues in like the first, like, three weeks so like the rate of release on that book is all over the place for me yeah because it's all done it's like one of the rare instances where like we the book is complete so they can do whatever they want with the schedule and and they are they are (laughs) they are uh, soon enough you'll just have batman in public domain at least amongst what we know i do think it's interesting because you know you're at this 10th anniversary where you could be like looking back are you at a place where you're kind of figuring out what tomorrow looks like for you to some degree um, I mean, there's plenty of things that just haven't been announced. That's almost always the case where it's like there's secret work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got like three other series kind of in the works that are kind of independent. The Batman gig is like a full-time job. That's the one thing that um, I kind of knew going in, but I really realized after working on the title for as long as I have now, there are so many moving parts and there's such a high demand on that book that it can only it can be my only kind of like company book 
really while I'm while I'm while I'm writing those kind of comics. So yeah, so so that's my focus, public domain because I'm writing and drawing it. Uh, that also takes up a ton of time. Between between those two books, that should be it. I, I probably shouldn't take on anything else, but I've got like I've got a new image book coming out, and I've got three other books coming out. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't quite stop. I'm not at the level I was two years ago because two years ago I had 14 books on the go at various stages, and now I'm looking at my schedule. I got like five projects that are kind of I'm currently working on. I've got like oh, I've got. Yeah, I've got two image books that are done and they're just waiting to come out. And then, yeah, the Sex Criminal 10th Anniversary stuff and Newburn wrapping up. Yeah, it's it's a lot. You have a whiteboard, right? I have a digital whiteboard. I have a whiteboard, but uh, like an actual whiteboard, but I never quite kind of got into writing and erasing on it. So <laughs> I've got like a real nice little digital kind of setup, color coded and what's you know what's at various stages what's ready to be sent to print and now a quick word from one of our sponsors looking for the right place to read digital comics you can find it at omnibus omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues volumes and omnibuses all day and date it's just like a comic shop where you pay per book but digital Omnibus has even upped its game lately, as they've added a web reader and store on top of its iPad version, with iPhone and Android coming soon. Looking for an ideal digital comic store, but with an excellent shopping and reading experience? One that uses novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book? And one that features many of the best comics and publishers in comics today, including publishers like Image, Boom, Dark Horse, and more? You can find all that on Omnibus. Visit the web store or download the app today at omnibus.app. And now, back to the show. I feel like you showed me some of that before, but I do think the interesting thing about Batman, what you're saying there is, is that, again, might not make sense to people, but it's like Batman isn't just Batman. Batman means that you're tied into universal stuff, which means that you're having to have the larger conversations, which means that you're having to not just know what you're doing. You have to know what kind of everyone is doing. And I know you wrote about this. You talked about how... I think you talked about it when you shared your Daredevil finale comic where it's like, I can't go to summits anymore for Marvel because yeah. I can't be privy to what's going on. Cause I know what's going on on the other yeah. side. I think people don't realize just how big taking on a book like that is because all of a sudden you're not just writing a comic. You're like architectural. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like there are meetings that I just have to be involved in now at this point, which is fine. Like I said, it's part of the job and like, it's a high profile gig and, it's the biggest book, right? <laughs> Whether I'm on it or not. But uh, but while I'm on it, I've got to make sure I'm on top of things. Yeah, that, that's a, definitely the kind of project where you can't fall behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, because everyone, I need to be ahead of almost everyone else writing uh, scripts that involve Batman because they need to know what I'm doing. Um, I can't like, I can't blow up their story after the fact, right? Yeah, because you just happen to have KG Beast when everyone is trying to include him <laughs> in their stories too. Everyone's got KG Beast fever. There's nothing I can do about it. The people are talking about KG Beast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. KG Beast. Oh, uh, God. He's, I always want to say that different ways. I'm just like, do you say KG Beast? I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, <laughs> there's like a subtlety to it. <laughs> yeah, there really is. <laughs> okay. But before we get further into Batman, I did want to talk about Newburn a bit because mm-hmm. actually, I looked back. We've never actually really talked about it. We talked about it in passing, but for some reason, it was this one that always kind of escaped my brain when we talk about it. It's an interesting one because even though I've read every issue and love what you and Jacob Phillips, uh, your collaborator who does pretty much everything else, is doing, you guys are doing a great job. But in some ways, it kind of feels like the unlikeliest book for you in that I think it might feel the least like what the idea of a Chip Zdarsky comic looks like to some, even though it's totally your kind of thing. I mean, you read Daredevil and it's, I don't know, I mean, like there's the vibe is there. What made Newburn a story you wanted to tell? Because I really love it, but again, like I can't escape the fact that it does feel a little different for you. Well, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday where I always find it hard to imagine there's such a thing as a Chip Zdarsky fan because I feel like everything I do is different, different genre. Like, yeah. like smart authors stick to a lane and build a brand like you know, Daniel Steele writes romance books. John Grisham does legal thrillers. Like it's, you know, there's, there's George R. R. Martin does fantasy. Like 
there's something to sticking to a thing and kind of building your audience and like but i'm the guy who did like jughead and daredevil howard the duck and batman the white like trees. it doesn't yeah yeah it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense or a public domain feels different from all of it and obviously sex criminals um so yeah i mean but i i i put out work the way i consume work like if you ask daniel Steele, do you just uh watch romantic movies she'd be like well fuck no of course not <laughs> like i watch comedies i love dramas you know i love like legal thrillers whatever um so i'm the same uh and i think most people are and so i just want to put out work that kind of reflects my tastes and like so with newburn it was like i love kind of gritty detective books and i also really love like tv procedurals i love the kind of the done in ones like there's a mystery to solve and by the end we've tied it up in a bow for you and maybe there's like a subplot kind of running through it all um, and newburn was kind of me attempting that like it's like law and order or the mentalist or any one of those kind of shows um that you can watch endlessly when you're sick in bed <laughs> and i was like oh what's the comic version of that but it started because i had the idea for the character I was like, oh, that's such a fun idea. Like, and it suits itself to that procedural feeling, which kind of made visualizing the comic easier for me. I do think, you know, going back to the what is or isn't a chip book, the funny thing about your stuff is simultaneously nothing is a chip book until it is one, if that makes sense. Where it's like, it yeah. seems like once you're excited about something, all of a sudden it's like, okay, you've opened this up. Now I see. Like, could there be more white trees? Sure, there could absolutely yeah. be more white, white trees. Could there be more kind of detective procedural type stuff? Absolutely. The thing I really like about Newburn is I have this love of like hyper competent people and just reading stories about them or watching stories yeah. or whatever. This is a terrible aside. I went and saw the Jason Statham movie, The Beekeeper. Of course you did. Yeah, I love action movies. And this is like <laughs> the best 80s action movie in forever. And that is the most hyper competent individual that has ever existed in terms of fighting and solving problems that, I mean, yeah, I, no spoilers, but uh, he's a tough <laughs> adversary, it turns out, for bad guys. Uh, but anyways, oh, wow. But, uh, he's, but Newburn, though, the thing I really love about him is, like, he's, like, the type of guy, he's kind of, like, not, not <laughs> classic Star Wars to Newburn comparison, kind of like Thrawn from those stories, where it's just, like, he sees all the angles, and you never really know what's going on inside him. Until yeah. you get to issue 14. And it was fa it was really fascinating reading that issue because it crystallized everything in that moment that preceded it. And also just makes me even more interested in the last two issues. Of and course. there was a part of me that was like, I'm surprised it hit then, it, it, you know, so far into the run. But then when I read it, I was like, I don't know when else you could have done that because it yeah. could have changed the book too much too early, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's a, it was a conscious decision through the run to not show his internal monologue right like we, we get insights into emily because of her diary pages but like i really wanted to make sure like newburn was a man of few words so you're kind of judging him on his actions for the most part and then to really kind of reveal stuff right at the end yeah because we're, we're going like you said we're, we're wrapping it up so issue 16 is the end and it feels satisfying to me um and then it's been fun and tricky to kind of do it in 16 page stories as well, which is like, you know, that was kind of one of the conditions. Like I know Jacob was like, he's fast, but he's busy. And so I'm like, we'll make him 16 pages. And I'm going to flesh it out with like, um, with diary entries to really kind of help the exposition of it all. So yeah, it's been a, God, it's been a fun challenge. I'm kind of sad to see it end, but also I'm like, I know it has to end, you know, was yeah. it always planned for that length? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, when I first started, I was like, oh, maybe it could go longer than that, but um, but sixteen felt like felt like the right amount of issues. There were sixteen page stories. There'd be sixteen issues. There were eight issue arcs. Like it all, it all kind of worked together. And I like the idea of like a two volume series that we can maybe do a nice hardcover at some point. Um, yeah, I was kind of at, at one point I was a little distracted because we we'd sold the rights to a studio and I wrote the pilot. Um, so at that point, I'm just like, well, maybe we could go for a hundred issues. Like <laughs> I'd be a fool to not do that. But then uh, even as I was writing the pilot, I'm like, no, no, this feels like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta do it while your heart's in it and get out before it's not. 
Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to the probably why you did the idea to begin with is it was it was something that excited you and you don't want to yeah. put it into a position where it becomes something that's like a, I don't know, a, a weight around your neck, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I've never stayed on a title um, past the point of caring about it. Yeah. There's no job I've taken that's just like, oh, OK, I guess this makes sense for my career or whatever. It's like, no, no, you do it until you feel like. It's time to walk off. Daredevil was like that. That was a plan. And yeah, if, if my feelings changed at any point, I would have figured out a way to wrap out of it earlier. It's interesting to think about the idea, though, because it's because it is that procedural, the one and done and stuff like that. You really could have made it go for as long as you want. The only thing is, is yeah. conceptually, it's like, would you get tired of Newburn always being one step ahead? Because he kind of always would have to. And yeah. the thing I like about its length is it makes the whole thing feel like this house of cards. He's very, very carefully managing and you can kind of see it slowly, slowly yeah. falling apart. And it makes it more of a pressure cooker the further you go on, knowing that it's it kind of felt like it was going to be about this long. I also yeah. love I want to give Jacob credit. I love that the final cover parallels the first. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did an amazing job on that. He's he's such a fine like he's so fast. He does everything on it besides the writing. Um, and he also does all the books with uh, Chris Condon as well. Like, and does criterion and collection, criterion covers. collection covers and all these other gigs. He's working on the Francis Ford Coppola graphic novel. Of course, of course, of course, I mean, of course. He had like a, a five minute window to draw those hundred pages or something like that. I mean, he it's cause he's not doing podcasts. We're sitting around talking. He's drawing pages right now. He's working. He's putting in the work. I know. Actually, I think he's in New York right now. Oh, not Taking working. Vacations. Yeah. Oh my God. How, I can't believe it. Yeah, the nerve. I did want to give you credit. I the, the 16 pages plus like the the diary pages. That's really nice. But also the backups are really yeah. good. Like I actually think I didn't put it on my list, but if I there was one comic I would add to my end of the year list, it would probably be well, Newburn, so I could get both, but also Go Back by David Brothers yeah. and Nick Dragata. That comic yeah. was so good. It's so good. They 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 work so well together. Yeah, like like I was saying to David, like it feels like poetry, like like the way Nick kind of plays with panels and like yeah. David's kind of rhythms with his dialogue. I'm like, oh man, it just really it flows so well, yeah, so well. It gives you a really good feeling. Well, and all the stuff that they've done together, they had the short box comics fair book. Um, yeah. Oh my god, uh, oh I'm completely. F- it involves fight. I know that. I the title oh, is yeah, escaping yeah, yeah. me right now. Yeah, yeah, I know the one. Fight like hell. I think it is. Yeah, that's it. Anyways, it's a really great comic, and it's the thing that's really cool about those backups is whether you're like reading Nadia Shamas's writing for the first yeah. time, or you're yeah. coming across you know, Nick and David for the first time. Those backups yeah. are really cool because it gives you a little extra flavor in this world, but it also introduces these new creators. But why was that something yeah. you wanted to include in the series? Was it partially because of length? Yeah, like I knew I was going to have these kind of extra pages, and. Um... Yeah, at the time, I was just like, well, like, I'd never quite felt like I was doing enough to kind of not mentor. I don't want to make it seem like I'm more to these people than I am, but like... Helping the next generation? Yeah, and I've I've gained enough kind of skills over the past 10 years. I think I'm probably, in a lot of ways, I'm probably a better editor than I am a writer, like, in terms of looking at a story and being like, okay, but how about this and how about that? Like, you know, this morning I was helping another comic writer with, like, a a script because you know, fresh eyes and all that. But, um, but yeah, yeah. It felt important to just be like, okay, well, like there aren't a lot of places, especially, especially within, within books that like maybe have a name creator. Like I know a Chip Zdarsky <laughs> uh, comic, you know, carries some kind of weight with it. Right. Um, so to be able to use that space to kind of help other creators and, uh, and also just selfishly for, for me, just like great content. Right. Like, like all the creators I've, I've I've known of their work, so it was, um, yeah, it was just kind of a pleasure to be able to kind of put them within the the title. Yeah, and 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 also because it's image, I'm like, you know, I, I I pay them, but also like I'm like, you still own this. Like this is all yours. Like you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. You want to flesh it out, make it a thing. Like, like go for it. Um, so that's that's nice. Yeah, I mean, if. David and, and Nick wanted to do something with Go Back afterwards. They have every right to do that. I, I would hope they do. It's like a... Yeah. It's such a good... I mean, I don't even know how long it adds up to, but it's probably about one issue. 
Yeah, they've got they've got enough material now that I think they're they're actually talking about putting it out as like a, a proper collection or a, a single issue. And yeah, yeah, I, I I love David obviously from manga explaining as well. Yeah, one of the projects I'm working on is with him, and uh, yeah, he's just he's he's so just so smart and he's so good at action stuff too. That uh, yeah, it's it's really a pleasure kind of seeing how he lays out a script. It's always a delight scene where he shows up because I got this book. Uh, it's a Hideo Kojima book about like kind of his view on art and stuff like that. Yeah. And I open it up and it says edited by David Brothers, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's so funny. Yeah, yeah, I love David. He's he's very good. Very good. I did want to talk a little bit about your for hire work. <laughs> I want to start with Avengers Twilight because it's such a fascinating book to me. What was the world like when you first wrote that series? Oh was, my god. Was that pre pandemic? It was. It was two thousand nineteen and like Yeah. I I gotta tell you, it's been a journey. Cause <laughs> Yeah, because I, I started talking to Tom Brevoort about it then, and yeah, I think my first script was 2019. I think I'd written all of it pre-pandemic, really, or at least uh, most of it. And yeah, kind of seeing how <laughs> how a lot of things in in the comic have kind of either come to pass or are about to come to pass, or like it it kind of makes me look like a hack a little bit. By the time issue six hits, people are going to be like, oh yeah, great. You're just ripping it from the headlines. I'm like, no, these weren't the headlines. I swear <laughs> to God. And there's also, I, I mean, I've had like conflicting feelings because, you know, issue one and two, and um, they're very much kind of about like, don't, don't buy the party line necessarily. Like you don't, don't give government like a free pass to just do whatever they want. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I was just like, Oh, please, for God's sakes, trust your government. <laughs> oh, I'm just like, okay. I think ultimately, I think the message is still true, but, uh, but yeah, I've, definitely, I've had a real roller coaster just in terms of like what I've written and do I feel strongly about it? And like, there was a period where I didn't. And then I kind of came back to like, Oh yeah, no, no, this, this holds up. I think, I think the messages are correct, but yeah, it's, it's a little wild to have a project be this long gestating and then coming out now in a, in one of the glorious American election years. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things is, is when I have cartoonists on and they normally finish the books they work, we're working on like a year, year and a half before then. Yeah. I can always tell that they're like searching for like, what did I do in this book again? But for mm-hmm. you, it's like, you're almost looking back on a different person engaging yeah. with a different world. And I imagine, I don't know how many interviews you did about the book, but it's fascinating because you almost have to like re-examine where you were in that moment. I mean, if you get questions that aren't like, why does Steve not have super soldier serum now? Like, or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I don't know. It it makes it a really fascinating book because it's, it's interesting because it's like, I understand why Marvel released it when they did in a sense, because it's the type of story you can kind of drop whenever because it's a temporal yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of it was just like Daniel took a long time on the art, like a long time, and so it, it really wasn't done until like this past fall, right? And I think they were just worried too about soliciting it before it was done, done because of those kind of delays, because you don't want to get caught with your pants down a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, and maybe, yeah. Maybe there's like a kind of a political thing and kind of world vibe as to when to release something like this, but you know. Yeah, it's 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 super weird. Like when I started writing it too, like my wife works in kind of in a career that kind of deals with misinformation and disinformation. So you know, having issue one uh, hammer home the point of like of the reevaluation of the Red Skull was mm-hmm. he good or bad? <laughs> like like I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's that 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 felt very current. For me, personally, in 2019, it feels so much more so now. Yeah. I don't suspect you're one of the people who reads reviews, but I suspect if you read no. reviews, you'd probably be seeing a lot of people being like, this is the most timely book. I can't believe it. it's so oh, really? yeah, for yeah. this moment. I, I didn't actually <laughs> read any, but I imagine people are saying okay. things like that. I do think it's kind of funny, though, because the easiest comparison point, I think, is probably Kingdom Come for a lot of people, where it's just like, this is a yeah. story down the line featuring characters engaging with the new world as an older version of themselves. Yeah. So yeah, I have to sure. ask, is this part of your master plan to single white female Mark Wade? 
<laughs> it's funny one of one of the emails i got congratulating me on the book was from mark yeah and I, I don't even think he put together that i'm basically ripping him off he's like <laughs> he's like he's like you know what i read it it's great i think it's your strongest work yet i really love it unless he's like unless he's like playing mind games with me as well like your strongest work yet because it's mine <laughs> <laughs> it's 4d chess he's playing with yeah you. yeah well it's funny like I, I kind of i looked at a lot of those kind of like future set stories you know dark knight returns and old man logan there's definitely like elements of that in there as well and 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 kingdom come um yeah it's hard to kind of avoid that that feeling you know the the dystopian kind of feeling well but also it's um superhero stories are i don't know i'm trying to think of the the best way to put it and they're they're always in conversation with each other and so it's like sometimes it's very specific like in your failsafe arc, or actually really just kind of your whole arc of, of uh, Batman, there's a lot of the Tower of Babel story that Mark Wade did with Howard Porter and everybody else mm-hmm. in that book. And and also he liked that, as you know. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just, there's always going to be, it's like my wife just read Catwoman Lonely City. She never really read oh, comics. Yeah, yeah. And she really loved it. And had she read the Darwin Cook stuff that was a really big influence on Chip or on Chip uh, on Cliff as he was doing that? No, but at the same time, she understood it because everything she needed was there. I think that these stories are kind of always in conversation with each other. I just thought it was really funny, like just the fact that that was happening and like Mark had what did he he had your Eisner Award for a long time or no? What was my Harvey? Yeah, Harvey. Yeah, Yeah, he accepted my Harvey for me. It does sort of seem like a slow revenge you're having on him. <laughs> it's pretty funny. We have a fun antagonistic relationship uh, online, but like he's just like the sweetest guy. Like whenever we do Zoom calls and stuff and talk through story things, he's just like he's the best. Like he's like he's probably my favorite writer. Yeah. Like now that I think about it, like when I think about like runs of his, like like the, the Flash. Flash, his Flash run was like that kind of got me back into comics because I I was an old school Barry reader. When I was like a, when I was quite young, and got into the Wally stuff, and then um, yeah, the Wade's run was just like it was awesome. And then Kingdom Come hit, and just so wildly good. And this Fantastic Four run is one of the best. Um, yeah, no, he's then the he's still going. That's the other thing that I love. Like uh, a lot of writers, kind of like either due to their own egos or due to the the shifting winds of fandom, like end up not working anymore um and mark still manages to not only work but put out like high quality stuff i think the thing that's interesting about mark's superhero writing not to make this like the mark wade super uh, superhero fan hour but you know you read the flash stuff that he did back then like we did that interview where it was uh the comics that that made you and one of them was i think was was it the return of barry allen i I think yeah 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 like that's that's an incredible comic my first comic i read of the flash was uh terminal velocity Mm. and it was like it was right after Impulse came, and it was like Wally fighting like this, I don't know, Cobra or whatever the hell it was. And like there was this just massive story, and I absolutely loved it. And it was one of the things that really hooked me on comics when I first got into them. And the thing about Mark's stuff is you read some comics by people, and they feel very of the moment. But Mark's yeah. stuff always kind of feels like timeless in a way, where it's like you could release Terminal Velocity today as a as a flash arc and you'd be like, this still works. Yeah. And that's a rare gift. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. He's, uh, he's the best. (laughs) And I'm going to keep ripping them off every, every, every chance I get. What's next on your hit list. Is that what's really on your digital whiteboard is just all of your favorite Mark Wade stories. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Fantastic four is next. Oh, that's good. That's good. Kick Ryan North off that book and do my Wade pastiche. Finally, somebody can take out Ryan North. Too tall, yeah. too strong. Too handsome. Too handsome. All the twos. Too Canadian. Yeah. You know, but going back to 2019, back when you were first doing, you know, Avengers Twilight, like, what made that a story you wanted to dig into? Like, a future that's broken and its only solutions might be broken old heroes. Beyond the Mark Wade of it all, of course. I mean, I was approached with the kind of the basic premise by Tom Brevoort. Because he had... He was keeping notes like he'd have ideas for a future Avengers story and he'd kind of like add some more notes to a document. And he kind of sent me the document. He's like, I've been thinking a lot about this and I think you'd be the, the, the person for it. You know, do you have ideas for it? Like, would you like to do it? And um, the big draw, honestly, was out of continuity, getting to use whatever characters I wanted like that. That 
just on the surface was like, okay, yeah, 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 I'll do it. Like, like it wasn't necessarily the burning need to tell a specific story, though that story kind of came quickly. I was like, oh yeah, no, there's, there's a, there's a way to do this where I feel like I'm saying something, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I maybe possibly because I was, you know, working on Daredevil and Devil's Reign and stuff and like having to do a lot of continuity things. I was like, oh no, this is, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is a kind of a breath of fresh air to, to me. Yeah. I mean, that totally makes sense. That's one of the things it's like, you're, you know, you're talking about with Batman and everything you have to deal with, not deal with that. That makes it sound like you can't stand it or something. Navigate. Like that. You have to navigate. navigate you have to navigate. You have to navigate all of the universal requirements. You have to navigate what other people are doing on other books. And so yeah. when you have the chance to do something that's kind of free of that, I imagine that that's nice. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And I think maybe my only kind of failing was I probably didn't break as free as I could have. Cause I'm so used to writing continuity books. Like every once in a while, like my note back from Tom would be like, you know what? You can kind of, fuck this character up more right like they're not coming back i'm like oh yeah okay yeah yeah you're right you're right you know i'm pulling my punches a little bit because i'm like i keep expecting other people to have to like deal with these characters but but I, but i don't and also obviously daniel acuna on art was like also a massive draw uh once he came on board i was just like oh yeah no this is gonna look so good i i don't know i was thinking about it i'm not trying to say that i don't know you are kind of lucky when it comes to artists. You have some amazing collaborators. I mean, like Jorge. I have to say, Bella Ortega. I've talked yeah. about that on this week's podcast uh, with Susanna Polo. That issue you did together on Batman was amazing. Like that, her She's art so was good. yeah, it was crazy good. Jacob, I mean Marco. Marco, come on. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. 2024 crowdfunding continues to roll on with Zoop. Now Live is a career-spanning companion by Bob Fingerman, with projects launching soon by Harley Quinn's Chad Harden, 2080's Jimmy Broxson, DC Comics' Chris Weston, and Prodigy Near Levy. When Zoop says there are more surprises in store, they mean it. This month is going to unveil a first in the crowdfunding space. To take part in all the fun, it takes less than 30 seconds to create an account. The e-commerce style checkout is easy and intuitive. You can add multiple rewards and add-ons into your cart, provide some info during checkout, and you're done. No confusing additional steps in finalizing your pledge, and no post-campaign surveys. And of course, every creator appreciates your support. For creators looking to crowdfund your project, Zoop is currently open for submissions. Email them at hellowearezoop.com to start a campaign. And now, back to the show. You know, I did want to ask you about Marco in specific, just because Marco, you worked with him for a long time. I, I don't even remember. Yep. Did you start in 2018 or 2019 on Daredevil? 2018, I think. So it was like a, a five-ish year run? Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was. We started working on it in 2018. I think the first issue came out in February of 2019. Okay, so like four years. So four yeah. plus years with Marco, basically, where he was doing the bulk of it. And yeah. sometimes doing a lot at once, like with Devil's Reign, where he's like, I'm going to do all of it. Yes. And you're like, all right, yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, based on your newsletter, it was a very collaborative partnership. Like, I love seeing the stuff where he was kind of taking your ideas and turning it into design and everything. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to suggest that you're sending Jonathan Hickman ominous emails like don't hurt him or something like that. But is it weird at all to see him working on other books without you at this point, just because you had been working so closely for so long? It is. And like the funny, weird secret is I was offered Ultimate Spider-Man. And there were a couple of reasons why I didn't take it. One, because I'm doing Batman. Uh, but two, because like, the whole idea like that was pitched like i got to read all the ultimate universe stuff uh that, that that hickman had already written and he had like kind of the plan for other books and stuff and i just read it all i'm like well this is so hickman like hickman should be writing this but like, he's never written spider-man like in, in my mind as i was reading kind of like with his kind of synopsis of the world and what he thought it should be um i was just like selfishly i wanted to write it like i, I wanted to be that guy I work with marco on a spider-man book like like obviously <laughs> but when i was like when i was reading that outline i was just like it's got to be hickman like you, anyone that you put in on this is just going to be like someone kind of trying to be hickman mm -hmm. and again yeah because he'd never really done spider-man i don't think it was a character that really quite appealed to him I, I i turned it down i said i think i think jonathan needs to be the one to do this and like months and months later like i, I ended up having a call with with hickman 
in which I, I talked to him a bit about it. And he was like, thank you for turning that down because I'm having so much fun on this book. I'm like, that's amazing. Like, and I, I talked to him a lot about Marco, just like how great is it working with Marco? And he's like, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been, it was weird <laughs> for sure uh, because I, I worked with Marco for so long, but I was just excited because I'm just like to see those two kind of create something wholly new that still feels like Spider-Man was just really awesome. Like that, that first issue was amazing. It really was. Like I, I just, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think I would have done an okay job, but nowhere near as good as what, what John did. I think it's, it's weird for Marco because he's also like, cause I've, I've kept talking to him and he would send me like his drawings of ultimate Spider-Man stuff. But I think it was weird for him because he was so used to the way I work with him, which is, uh, I gave him too many notes. <laughs> But I would respond a lot to his pages. Like every page, I'd like have something to say about it, and like we go back and forth a lot. And I think uh, Hickman's very much like you're the artist. You know what to do. Here you go, off you go, which is a great way to work. And I wish I could kind of do that. So I think Marco was like, he wasn't struggling at all, but I think he just felt like, does he like it? <laughs> is he happy with what I'm doing? He's like not he just didn't to know. Me like because, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like he's not giving me notes, so it's like there's that weird thing too. Like when you don't get notes, you're just like, wait a second. Like, I, I know I'm not perfect. Like I get this way with an editor. If I, if I deal with an editor who gives me no notes, I'm just like, okay, something's wrong. They've just given up on me. Yeah. Because I know I'm not delivering perfect scripts. Like mm-hmm. I kind of need some sort of feedback on, on these. So I think Marco was just like, Oh, am I doing a good job? And I'm like, so I was the one telling him he was doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate <laughs> Spider-Man. And like, I, I know, like, and I talked to Hickman and I talked to him, and I'm like, Marco's crazy. Like, yeah, all these pages are amazing. I'm like, okay, just let him know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so happy for him, though. Like, Marco deserves it. Like, yeah. Yeah, he put in so much time on Daredevil. Devil's Reign was so great. Everyone just loves his work, and it just kept getting better and better. Like, to see him with such a high-profile title and just killing it is amazing. That's the thing that really actually impresses me the most about Marco, is that you look at his first stuff that he did on Daredevil back with like Andy Diggle. And then you look at what he did with you. And then you even look at that first issue of ultimate Spider-Man, like the first issue where it's like the final page and you have on the top, I think it's like uncle Ben saying a line. And then it's like Mary Jane and saying the the same, the line. And it's just like this, the storytelling in it is just so incredible. And like everything he does, you just keep seeing him improve and improve and improve. But yeah, actually, you know, not to dig too much into it. Cause I know this is like, like state secrets type stuff to some degree, but you had mentioned before about how, I mean, Marco's a super Spider-Man fan. Like that's a, yeah. that's a thing. And yeah. he had mentioned about how like the idea of like you guys working on a Spider-Man book together and you're just like, ah, I can't do that. It was, it was kind of in reference to amazing. Was that like a thing that was actually happening in background as you were finishing Daredevil? No, I mean, or I, like, I think I was done. Like I'd, I'd written, I'd written all the scripts and stuff. So the ultimate Spider-Man thing kind of was gestating after I delivered the script. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just funny that Marco was kind of advocating for you two to work on Spider-Man together. And you're like, ah, I can't do this. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I would love to. And then I, you know, I told him like when I got the Batman gig, I, I and he would kind of ask me more about doing stuff. I'm just like, he was like, just even like a graphic novel. I'd love to do like a Spider-Man graphic novel, like its own thing. I'm like, that'd be amazing. I, I'm doing Batman. I can't do it. Like, like there's only so much time. There's only, you know, so much of, of me to go around and um i wouldn't want to produce something of low quality for marco too because like you know if i'm doing a graphic novel with him about spider-man it's going to take like a year of his life and if i'm just like shitting out a script over like a couple of weeks for this thing like that's that's a disservice to him and to the reader so like yeah maybe maybe in the future one day i'll i'll end up doing a spider-man thing with marco that'd be awesome that'd be awesome like he's he's my guy like great all right you did once tell me that you had no interest in writing amazing spider-man which makes sense i think to anyone who's spent like two seconds following the conversation surrounding that title yeah but like now that i've been doing batman i feel a little differently well that was actually what i was going to bring up is like you know you you, you're doing batman the flagship title for that character where that's the conversation is going to orbit that book has that kind of recontextualized how you look at like how that experience would be as, as a person writing this character that is just going to get like the maximum amount of focus on him. Yeah. I mean, I, I took Batman without really thinking about it 
but but I also knew like okay, as soon as I take Batman, like it's a similar vibe to Spider Man where no one no one's going to agree with your vision and you're going to have specific types of fans that are going to like be angry. So I told myself really early on, I'm just like, well, I'm just I'm turning all that off. Like, yeah. I just I just shut it off and like I focus on my Substack. I never check Twitter or anything like that. Like, um, and when I meet fans at the show, they're great. Like, you know, I I drove across the country. I did like 14 comic shops or something like that, and like everyone was fantastic. It was amazing. So I've I've learned to to just kind of disassociate from all of that, and and so yeah, that's kind of helped me kind of rethink my stance on writing Amazing Spider-Man. Like I would probably do it now. Because I'm like, oh, it's actually quite easy. Batman's been a very easy gig mm-hmm. in a lot of ways because you, I tune out the noise. I don't read reviews or anything like that. I just do the book that I want to put out. And I would probably handle Spider-Man the same way. Like, I think Zeb is kind of handling it that way as well. Like, he kind of like retreated from social media. So, yeah, it's funny. Like, I had dinner with Zeb. I don't think we talked about Spider-Man or Batman once. <laughs> Like we just like talked about life and comics and stuff, and like it was like a group dinner. But but even still, it's like oh yeah, no, that's that's our job. Like we do our job and stuff. But like I don't know, you clock out at the end of the day, like that's it. Well, I mean, we were talking before we started recording about comic conventions and like going mm-hmm. to them and trying to like have a a balance between like doing things for yourself versus doing things for your career. And I mean, when you're on a big book like that, I don't think it does anyone any good to like keep their eyes on the conversation because I brought this reference up way too many times. I'm gonna bring it up again. Anyways, it reminds me of what Dan slot told me. He, it was after he had finished superior Spider-Man and he was talking about when like superior Spider-Man was announced, it was like, he had just ruined the world and everyone was so upset. And then when superior Spider-Man finished, people are like, I don't want this to go. I like this too much. I mean, fundamentally your job is to, this is like a demeaning maybe to like how it's your job is to tell stories, but your job is also to give people what they don't know that they want. And it's to, it's to tell a story that's going to surprise and delight them in a way that they haven't gotten before. Did I expect Zur and R to go into a robot body? No, but now I'm like, I'm pretty interested. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, a few years ago I was doing a bunch of captain America research. And so I was kind of rereading a lot of the Mark Greenwald stuff where, you know, he becomes the captain and John Walker becomes Captain America. And I loved those books as a kid. Just loved them. Yeah. And But looking at the letters pages, it is universally loathed. Like, I don't think I've ever seen letters pages from month to month in which, like, 95% of the letters are furious at what Marvel has done. Like, just absolutely apoplectic. And I'm just like, and that was considered, like, maybe the best run of Captain America, besides maybe Brubaker. I guess a story that's inspired so many other characters and stories and the TV show and all this stuff. And like, and it's, it's wild. Like, like imagining that storyline happening now with Twitter, yeah. Twitter is the, Twitter's the letters page, except it's less well thought out. Right. Cause you don't have to like, you know, type it up and put it in the envelope and, <laughs> and send it off. There's not all those stages, which is like, Oh, fucking Marvel's this. And they're, they hate this and that and they're racist or whatever. Like, um, yeah, yeah, like it just wouldn't have survived these days uh, unless Marvel just like wisely just like ignored that and put out the books, understanding that they're putting out a good story and that people people haven't seen the ending yet. Like, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's comics. Don't worry, the characters gonna be fine at the end. <laughs> yeah, they they always bounce back in the end, w- one way or another. Uh, Peter Parker will be. Uh, I remember like one of the big things when I wrote a piece for the the ringer about where Spider-Man was right before Spider-Man Homecoming came out. And I remember thinking about the fact that at that point, I think I think Peter Parker was super rich because he was running like Parker Industries or whatever. Yeah. But it's just like, you know, Peter Parker is going to be like down on his luck in an apartment soon enough. And sure enough, then he was roommates with Boomerang because that's what his life is. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like it's it's, with characters have been around that long, like. Like you, you always have to kind of bring them back to the reset at some point, or else the, the character arc just takes them to this place of perfection and happiness, and then you're done. Like that's it. Like <laughs> story over. Can you imagine the in-world profiles they would write about Peter Parker about his life, just him as a person? They're like he he became like a billionaire or whatever, and then all of a sudden is yeah. living with two other people in a New York apartment and everything. There'd be profiles: the rise and fall of Peter Parker. 
yeah, he says this this guy who was like like a photographer that ended up putting out a book of photography about Spider Man and going on tour, and then he married a supermodel, <laughs> and then like <laughs> he became like then he became a a high school teacher, and then back to being a photojournalist, and next thing you know, he's running Parker Industries, and now he's like you know <laughs> lost that all. Yeah, like it's 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 wild. Like you really have to like especially on a title like Spider Man, you have to really step back from continuity just a little bit to make sure the characters can be real. Cause like when you look at all the supporting characters in Spider-Man, they've all died, been superheroes, been supervillains, have had powers. Like, like there's no world in which those characters can just walk down the street to get a coffee and just talk about their lives yeah. because they should all be locked away in like weird rehabilitation centers for all the stuff they've gone through. But you have to kind of disassociate from the continuity enough to like, to make them relatable somehow. I, I was on Stilt Man's Marvel fandom page because of that's you what I that's what I do in my life. Sure. And sure. his living status was written as, and I quote, alive, semicolon, formerly deceased. <laughs> <laughs> Comics, the only place where you can be formerly deceased. I had never seen that before, and I was just like, that is incredible. I wonder what percentage of Marvel would categorically be formerly deceased. A very high percentage very high and it's like it's getting harder and harder to kind of like surprise readers because so many things have been done before like you know when when gene gray died like that was a big deal and gwen stacy died that was a big deal but now like i don't know you kill off any character like it doesn't matter at all like you know hickman was was wise to kind of create the idea of this constant regeneration yeah. of the x-men because it's like well if you're if it doesn't matter then just lean into it but now that's going to be done and it's like okay well if an x-men dies now does it matter if any character dies now does it matter if a character you know gets married or pregnant or you know has a lost brother or whatever like sure you're, you're getting dangerously close to superhero nihilism there i mean there, there there is a there is a danger there it is it is harder to kind of come up with kind of new things to do with characters that have been through so much right um it's definitely it's definitely the challenge. Like smarter people than me will figure it out, but uh, I, I I definitely struggle with it. I have to give you credit. You say that, but I think you're uniquely good at doing something that very few are few people are, which is writing an ending that actually works as an ending. Like, um, I mean, I, I had you on for an entire episode about Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man three ten, which is I think like oh, yeah. one of the best Marvel issues in the past decade. I, I think that's absolutely incredible. But then the finale for you and Marco's Daredevil, the thing that I think is interesting about that book is it simultaneously feels like a real ending in a way that we never get, but also a new beginning. Yeah. And like that is a really, really tough line to walk. And you seem to do it very well. So what's the secret, Chip? I mean, with, with that, it was like, I just wanted to be really conscientious of the fact that it has to continue. Good luck, Saladin. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, having him go through a thing and have him kind of, quote unquote, reborn, but then giving you the taste of what his life is to come, that it's, that is, a, there is a to be continued at the end of that. It's not just like a, it walks off into the sunset. Um, even with, the, even with Fisk, like, like that was planned, the idea of him, like, literally getting into a boat and sailing off to the sunset with his wife. Like, that's an ending for the character. But I also knew because I'd help set it up that Jerry was going to bring him. Jerry was going to have that boat go to Krakoa. I love that. And, and I know it was like, we were giddy with the idea of it. <laughs> like, well, I mean, isn't that the idea of superhero stories? It's kind of like going back to the Mark Wade stuff is just wherever you leave characters is somewhere that someone else can pick them up and find a new answer. Yeah. 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 And with Daredevil, it's like, it, it felt like such a, it felt like a strong ending and like a strong launch pad for Saladin. And, and, Luckily, he agreed and he ran with it, or else it would have been a real problem. Yeah, it made sense to me. I am the weirdo whose favorite scene in that comic, by the way, was uh, Reed Richards and Foggy Nelson playing chess. That scene was amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah, really good. I, I was I was happy with the final issue being able to kind of like tie back to everything. Yeah, it was super satisfying to to write and to have Marco draw it. Yeah, yeah. I I, I miss that title for sure. But I'm happy to read it. That's the other thing, like being able to read Daredevil for the first time in years. <laughs> it's like it's a joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. Nice. I mean, it's it's Daredevil. It's the uh, the comic that kind of I don't know. Everyone, I was gonna say everyone gets a shot. Not everyone gets a shot at, but whenever you do, it's always like 
there's a lot of weight to it because of its history and it's like your chance to shine it's your yeah. chance to shine and it's like because he's so removed from other characters and groups mm -hmm. um you can you can you can have him not be in costume for 10 issues like you couldn't do that with spider-man you can do that with batman you can do it with daredevil god people um, would be really mad about that if that happened spider-man <laughs> It just wouldn't happen. Like the editor would be like, "Well, no. <laughs> Why is he not in like, his costume? He's got to be Spider-Man in every issue. Like this is the flagship book. Like uh, whereas Daredevil, you can take a lot more risks thanks to the creators that came before that where it worked. Like if it didn't work, then you wouldn't be able to do that. But because of like Miller and Nocenti and you know Brew Baker, Bendis, Charles, like because of every, what everyone did before me, that's why I have the leeway to do what I want. And that's why Saladin has the same leeway. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's it's the best title. It's it's definitely my favorite title I've ever worked on. It's fantastic. But just two more questions. Yeah. I had a, a patron question. It references something you actually brought up earlier, which is your cross-country trip in Canada to visit comic shops. Uh, Brian asked, what were the best and worst experiences or things that you learned from that ex from that trip? God, best and worst. I mean, the best was just just seeing actual readers <laughs> like you know on the other end of a pandemic like i wasn't doing conventions or anything um so actually being able to engage with readers like to work on basically all of daredevil and all of batman without actually meeting a reader is weird yeah and and being able to actually meet them in person and seeing that the books touch them and um and that stores that it the, the retailers love them as well like that was wildly satisfying and it reinvig reinvigorated me and I didn't realize I needed that either. Like mostly the cross country trip was an excuse to drive because I just learned to drive. And so really? for me, yeah, yeah. That was my pandemic project. I learned to drive because we were living in BC. I'd never driven before. And when you're out there, you kind of need to know how to drive because we were living on a tiny island. Um, it turns out I love it. <laughs> so when we got back to Toronto, um, we kind of we shipped our car back to Toronto. And then I was like, I think I need to drive across the country my wife was like all right have fun and so we i planned out the trip just for that reason because like being in a car by yourself is just such a joy like put down the windows put on your music like pull over for shitty food like the whole experience is amazing so i didn't really anticipate what the shops would be like and and how um how fulfilling that would be and like i said like reinvigorating as a creator Cause you're always like, you know, I write for myself, you know, I'm the audience here, you know, that's the high minded kind of writer, but it's commercial comics. Like you still want people to read it and you still want people to like it. So actually having that feedback was like, Oh yeah, this is great. Like people actually are enjoying the books. I, I love, I love that fact. I, I don't can't really think of too many negatives. Like there were definitely shops where it was like, okay, I've got, I got to put in my time here in this, in this shop. <laughs> I thought it was going to be your your endless speeding tickets you got. I was I follow the rules. I'm a new driver, but the um like there were some shops where like hundreds and hundreds of people like massive lineups like down the street like it was like that felt good. It was some pressure, but you know you get through it. And then you do a shop in like Northern Ontario where you're just like, all right, okay, twelve people an hour, okay, that's fine. You know, keep the ego in check a little bit. Um, but even those weren't negative experiences because I got to actually kind of hang out with people. Like I was able to do full sketches and like talk to people about comics and like, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people kind of coming into the shop for the first time since COVID too, which was a, a thing I didn't really think about kind of reintroducing people to their local comic shops was, was satisfying. Um, yeah. There's no, there's no, re there's no real negatives to it. Like it was hard to work on the road. Like I would, I would do it like a day on day off. So I would drive to a new city and then basically spend the next day working out of the hotel room or whatever. And then I do the sign the next day and then drive the next day. Like I spaced it out pretty well, but it was still hard to kind of get work done. Yeah. I mean, I was actually going to bring that up earlier because you're going to Emerald city comic con this year and then you got other things planned. That's one of the interesting things when it comes to your schedule, you know, anyone's schedule is like when you do a con, that's like four days or three days yeah. or whatever, where you basically, it's just like work is out unless you decide yeah. to work after you do the day and like you're going to be burned out you're going to be tired you're going to be all these different yeah. things and that's time that you lose and have to make up at another time and th that can be a lot yeah you learn that pretty quickly like i write on the flight there i write on the flight back like that kind of helps but um but it's also why i'm still 
uh, I'm still the guy at the shows in the masks with the air purifiers because yeah. like I also recognize from doing conventions before COVID like con crud's real and like not only do you lose those four days you'll probably lose a few more days after from being sick so it's like you want to get rid of a week or two weeks of your work time like no yeah i mean that was one of the things that stood out. i did a piece about conventions after new york comic-con and like several people were just like i have to bake in the idea that it's not just four days it's 14 days yeah and and like and how do you balance that it's it's very difficult to do but yeah i mean you know knock on wood like almost all my comic friends got sick after new york comic-con except for me and i'm like yeah i was like i had like weird nasal sprays and like sanitizing my hands and my table and like a little air purifier at my desk i look like a madman and i recognize that fact but also i'm like but i'm if i'm the only one that gets away without being sick for 14 days that's a that's a trade-off i'm willing to do yeah i i totally get it i totally get it but last question i want to ask about it relates to something i brought up earlier Last time you were on the podcast, I kind of had the sense that you didn't know what was next for you. I don't want to say you were kind of going through an existential crisis, but it did oh, kind I of... Was. You were? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I yeah. mean, it, it, it did feel like you had what you were working on, but you didn't really know what was next, and you also yeah. didn't really know what that meant for you. Yeah. How are you feeling now? Like, are you feeling... You know, it sounds like you've got a lot of projects on the horizon. Are you feeling better about what's next for yourself? Yes. I mean... Yeah, last time I talked to you, I was definitely, and again, this is because I wasn't talking I wasn't to people, seeing, talking to people, seeing readers, not engaging online. So like, I really had no feedback from anyone. So it was it was kind of like I was putting comics out into a void, with only people that I was doing them for with my editor, my artist, um, and I think that hit me harder than I thought, especially like with the pandemic stuff. Um, but yeah, now that I'm actually seeing people and feeling kind of feeling the love or whatever that's that's helped a lot and like i, I feel myself winding down still again like you know I'm, i've got five projects not 14 and that's you know very conscious so i don't hurt myself it's probably healthy too yeah yeah it, it is like <laughs> 10 years in comics is as we said before it's aged me horribly <laughs> and i, I kind of want to slow that down a little bit yeah i'm just i'm doing things i want to do I mean, I've always done things I want to do, but now I'm really just like really focusing on, yeah, on what I can control. Um, part of me wishes I had a, a bigger brain and more energy, like 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 James Tinian, so I could like take over the world in comics. But like, I just don't have it in me. I'm too old. I'm too tired. So I'm very happy to kind of like kind of do the jobs I want to do and like put out the books for the people that you know, want to read them. But I, I'm not shooting for kind of mass market appeal or anything like that. Like just. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's a it feels like a weird position to be in where I, I have enough cachet that I can kind of get books off the ground, but there's also a part of me that knows like, well, you know, this idea is kind of weird and not going to hit, but it, the people it does hit are really going to like it, so that's good. Well, I did a year long series of interviews with James, and yeah. one of the things he actually said was, I'm not going to quote him, but I will paraphrase him something along the lines of like his goal is eventually to kind of slow down a bit and to do yeah. less, and. Yeah. I think that's a perfectly reasonable goal because I think that producing so much endlessly can be harmful to your creative brain and to your personal self. And so you got to yeah. find a balance between all of that. And it seems like you, especially after you got out into the world and you got to meet people and you got to mm -hmm. see everyone and got to see Jorge and radiate off of his glow. <laughs> it, it feels like you've found that balance again to some degree. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm always itching to do something different. Like my my greatest joy over the past few years was doing those chip class videos, <laughs> and like I I want to do more. I want to do more stuff like that. Like I, I'm working with buddies on kind of creating like some dumb videos and things like that because because uh, yeah, it actually satisfies me in a way that maybe comics doesn't. Yeah, well, you got to keep scratching those itches. But Chip, yeah. I love everything you do, but I especially okay. love talking with you. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about Newburn, your career, Batman, and everything else. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, David. Woo! No woo? woo. Yeah. <laughs> woo! <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer artist Chip Zdarsky. You can find him in his email newsletter on Substack at zdarsky.substack.com and in his work in Batman, Public Domain, Newburn, Avengers Twilight, and The All Nighter. Love Off Panel, want to support it? 
Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating or review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash panel, and when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast, as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site Sketched at sketch.com for long-form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content. You can find Off-Panel and Sketched on social media by following on Twitter and Instagram at, at @sketchcomic or following me at, at @slicefriedgold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Faith Aaron Hicks, Ah Yeah Comics, Ben Rowe, Cameron Brown, Jonathan Breen, Danny Ollie, Charlie Stickney, Tom Drennan, Jeremy Thomas Burke, Jared Schwab, C- Scott Dunn, Chip Mosher, Alan Ellsworth, Seth Pomeroy, James McEwen, Andrew Lehman, Christina Merkler, Scott Place, Travis Gibb, Darcy Van Polgies, Travis Schmeiser, Tom Evans, Natalie Mockery, Reed Beeman, Kelly Sudaconic, Max Wood, Jeremy Lambert, Brian Hole, Chris Doray, Near Levy, Jason Hussa, Kieran Gillen, Jonathan Kent Uratam, Henry Johnson, Jingo Boren, James Tyne the Fourth, Chris Langford, Jason Wood, Tom Peachy, Ben Dom. Instead, Rom V, Nick Walker, Petra Coyle, Isaac Orens, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Van Deven, Submit Industries, Jack Mulqueen, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Canadian by Proxy, Bradley Raider, Carl Troy, Brandon Pillis, Patrick Power, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, Liana Kingis, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Susanna Polo, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Andrew Carita, Matt, Stephen Hall, Philip Myra, Chris Bachalo, Torin Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Chris Ta, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Gip, Sean Kirkham, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwand, Vita Ayala, Akil, Philip C.B., Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Nick Polito, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogert, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Colin McMahon, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Wolfpack for letting me use their song Outro as the show's opening theme and to upright T-Rex Music who wrote performed off panels theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.